Most of us have probably never been in a battle, unless you're a veteran of one of the wars, and many of you are, and congratulations and thank you for being part of the land of the brave. Thank you very much. But most of us who've never been in a battle have no idea what it's like, the terror of just bombs going, around, going on around you and bullets whizzing by and attacks against you, hand-to-hand -hand combat, being bombed from, a, from above by airplanes, tanks, ships off, offshore, whatever. I had two uncles who uh, were in the army and they fought in the Philippines in World War II. And uh, whenever they would talk about it and their band of brothers, uh, it wasn't a pleasant conversation. Uh, it, it brought back a lot of memories of being wounded, of being shot at, of being terrified, of seeing your best friend dead beside you or wounded badly or arm shot off. And it was, uh, you know, they, they didn't often talk about it. But um, my uncles uh, did come back from that alive. They spoke of those who were bloodied and wounded and how they often would have to get right back into the fight so they wouldn't be overrun. And they knew about battle. They knew all about it. My uncles couldn't just slough it off. Then I remember one time one of them looked at me and he says, Philip, have you ever been in a real war, in a real battle? And um, I pretend to think a little bit for a second or two. And really the closest I could tell them was a really fierce battle of laser tag that uh, my kids and I and some of their friends had, had engaged in uh, years ago, maybe 20 years ago or more. And uh, they smiled and nodded and realized I didn't know what their kind of real battle was. However, I have been in real battles, and so have you, uh, spiritual battles. And these are the kinds of battles for the control of our thinking, our thoughts, our habits, the way we live, what we do, what we give into, what we don't give into, what we do, good and bad. And some of us aren't even aware of a battle. We try to do good but we're not even aware that it's an all-out battle sometimes. And that's why I gave the first part of the sermon, the being aware of the battle. If you missed part one, please try to go back and listen to it. In there, I, I, I commented on how our real fight is not against anybody that you think is against you, no matter how bad they get or how mean they become. That's not our real battle. Uh, Paul says in Ephesians 6, for we don't war against flesh and blood, but against spirits in high places. That's what he said. And so he says, put on the armor of God and stand in the power of his might. And Paul, at the end of his life, and I, I, you know, just remember, we are called to fight. Paul, at the end of his life, after telling Timothy many times, be a good soldier, Timothy. And then he says at the end of his life in 2 Timothy 4, I have fought the good fight. And there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness. And for all those who love his appearing, 2 Timothy 4, and those who uh, came before us. Abraham, David, Deborah, Jael, Abraham, I said already, uh, Gideon. They were fighters. They were willing to fight for their beliefs and fight for uh, when they were attacked, fight for their nation that God had given them. And there were so many others. And they also had spiritual fights as well to, to, to go up against. Now, we've not just been called to fight Satan and his temptations to make us give in or... Uh, we fight the temptation to give up or to sin. No, no. We fight to win. We don't fight just to engage, to participate, to hold it to a draw. No, no, no. We've been called to be overcomers, to be victors, to be winners. You can read to all the uh, seven churches of Revelation 2 and 3, to just about all of them. God says, to the overcomer, I will do this and I will do that. So that was all in part one and much, much more. So hi everyone, I'm Philip Shields, I'm the host and uh, founder of Light on the Rock. Welcome to your website, I call it your website, we don't charge you anything for this. We don't have these gimmicks that if you send us a generous offering, we'll send you this DVD or CD or you get to continue listening after you've watched eight minutes or something. No, we don't do that. Uh, our goal is to help you have a closer walk with God and there's no price for that. Uh, God has freely given to us and we freely give back to you. Um, we do support a group of Kenyans over in Kenya who has a, an orphanage, 30 kids, and uh, help them survive. And so uh, we do thank those who participate and help out with that. Uh, we don't normally ask for any help, and uh, I don't take an income from this. But anyway, remember you can click 
on the video. Let's go back to the home page just for a second, Scott. Scott's my webmaster. At the top of the home page, the very top, go across the top, you'll see home and then, and then videos. You can just click on the word videos and see a whole bunch of videos that we have created. Uh, we're start, starting to do more and more videos. The next one is sermons, meaning audio sermons. The videos are audio videos. I'm, I'm sorry, are video sermons. The next one where it says sermons are audio sermons. And then blogs are short articles that I really hope some of you are checking out the blogs too. There's a lot of thought-provoking articles that are being written in there by myself and others who contribute. And so thank you very, very much for checking it out. Or go back to the home page. You can, on that home page, scroll down and you'll see recent LOTR, meaning Light on the Rock, video sermons. Now, if you click on that, you'll have an option to watch the video. And we do try to put graphics and pictures and even short videos in there. Or you can choose to click on the word audio, audio of, of the video, just an audio. And that way you can make yourself MP3s and be able to listen to them while you drive or things like that. Um, some of you were asking for that. I think you should try to watch the videos as often as you can, though, because we put an awful lot of work into that, and I think you'll enjoy them. Now scroll down further down, and Scott will do that, and we're, we're going to go to the next one is recent LOTR sermons, audio sermons, and I'll be doing more and more new ones of those as well. It's a lot less work for us, for, for Scott, just to have an audio sermon out there, and so be watching for that as well. Uh, the newest audio on there is Blessed Are the Pure in Heart, uh, for they shall see God. And the Gentiles in the faith, I have a couple sermons there. If we can show that, Scott, Gentiles in the faith, take heart, part one and two. Sometimes we'll uh, replay a sermon from, from the past. Anyway, so uh, remember that, and thank you very much for coming to our site. Many of you come from about 70 countries. We really appreciate that very much. Now, why do you need this topic? When I'm hearing someone else, I always like to know, why do I need to spend an hour listening to, to this topic or this guy, whatever? Well, we have to be ready for some really, really big battles coming. And, I, and, and, and the day-by-day -day battles that we have to fight in our head are getting us battle seasoned, battle ready. You have no idea. I have no idea how bad it's going to be. The Bible says it's going to be worse than the world's ever seen, worse than the Noah, Noah's, the, 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 it's not Noah's flood, it's God's flood in the days of Noah. Worse than that, worse than the Romans and the Babylonians sacking the temple and Jerusalem and all of that and burning it. No, a lot worse than that. A lot worse than the uh, uh, Spanish Inquisition. A lot worse than anything we've ever seen. The Nazi pogroms, a lot worse. And we will be involved in that in the coming years. I do not believe that all of God's people are going to be raptured somewhere. I do not believe that. I'll give a sermon maybe within a month on, on the rapture or... If, what does the Bible actually say about that? But anyway, even, even for those of you who believe in the rapture, and many of you do, but even if you believe in the rapture, surely many of us are still going to have to go through the initial testings and phases of it um, before, before we're put into a place of refuge or safety. I do believe in a place of safety. The Bible says it's uh, somewhere in a wilderness. And, um, and so anyway, but we'll talk about all that some more too. So in my notes, I'll give you this. Well, we'll pop them up here too. Uh, Luke 21, 36. It just says there, just pop in the text. Uh, Luke 21, 36 says that to pray, watch and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape the things coming upon the earth. And then uh, the time of great trouble. Then Revelation 3, verses 10 to 12, to the Philadelphians, God says, and because you're faithful, I'm going to keep you from the hour of temptation or hour of trial coming upon the whole face of the earth. And then in Revelation 12, verses 10 to 17, it speaks of the woman, the church, being taken to her place, her place in the wilderness, where she is taken care of by God for three and a half years. In the meantime, those not counted worthy to escape are left outside, and Satan goes after them with everything he has. Uh, at the end of Revelation 12, you'll read that. That he, I think that's Revelation 12, 17 or 18, I think it's 17, where he then goes after the remnant of the woman uh, who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And I'm sure, though, that whether we go to that place of safety or not, all of us will go through 
more and more hard times and testing uh, as God is God is sifting out the getting out the bad stuff you know he's redeeming us refining us uh, like good silver good gold and uh, God's at work doing that in all of us so I'm sure we're going to be tested and when these big battles come any commander the commander-in-chief of our life is uh, Yeshua Jesus Christ and uh, any commander would prefer, knowing he's going into a big battle, to have seasoned troops, troops who are used to the war, know what to do, uh, have experienced the fear and faced it. And seasoned troops, he would, he would prefer that to brand new recruits who have never had any experience of war. And so we're going to go through a lot of seasoning, if you will, a lot of seasoning of, uh, of battle. Now, also, besides the fact that it's, it's preparing us for the big one, the other reason we need to know this is it's the overcomers and the winners, the victors, who get the rewards and the prize. We are saved by grace. Please don't misunderstand me. We're saved by grace without our works. Without works. Ephesians 2 verses 8 and 9 are so clear on that. And Romans in so many places. Without our works. We're saved just simply because of God's favor and mercy and his grace towards us. But it's also very clear in the Bible that we're rewarded by our works. And to have works means we've got to fight the temptations and the desires and the pulls not to bother with something. So we've got to have works. We have to overcome. Saved by grace, rewarded by works. The reward is not salvation. The reward is not eternal life. The reward are the things that we'll be doing for all eternity. But, you know, five cities, ten cities, that kind of thing that Yeshua talked about. Second John 8, the Bible is totally unapologetic about seeking rewards, and it's a good thing. Second John 8 says, Look to yourselves that you don't lose the things you've worked for, but that we may receive a full reward. A full. Look to yourselves. Don't lose it. So we fight for the reward. Moses, it says in Hebrews 11, uh, was willing to uh, turn down the pleasures of sin for a moment and look forward to the reward in Hebrews 11, 26. When Christ returns, we're told in Matthew 16, 27, we'll post a scripture up as we talk, just a, just a text, I mean, just the um, where it is, Matthew 16, 27. Uh, it, it says in there that when Christ returns, his rewards are with him to give to each one according to his works. So we have to be fighting sin and the things that pull us down. So we have the rewards. And we will overcome by the blood of the Lamb. That's how we overcome, by the blood of the Lamb. But we have to fight the enemy. And we come under and behind Yeshua, who's our commander, who has already had the victory. But he does want us to be engaged in it as well. So we must, first of all, recognize there is a war going on. And then when we're in this war, if you excuse me using the term, I hope it doesn't offend you all, but in Matthew 16, 18, and you shall say to and, and I say to you, Peter, that on this rock, not Peter, Peter is Petros, little rock, on this Petra, on this huge rock, meaning Christ Himself, I will build my church. And the gates of Hades, the gates of hell, shall not prevail against it. So he's saying to us, when you get into this fight, I want you guys to fight like hell and to defeat hell, defeat Hades. And uh, that's what Yeshua himself said. And the gates of hell will not prevail. Think about what that just said. Gates don't attack. Gates defend. That means that we're the ones on the attack. God wants us to be like the SEAL Team 6, like, uh, like Delta Force, like stormtroopers. He wants us to be right in there recognizing, okay, this is a battle. I'm being tempted to do something that my carnal nature wants to do. I'm going to fight it. I'm going to fight it. I'm going to give it everything I've got plus everything God's got to give me as well. And of course, the difference between the battles we're in compared to the battles my uncles were in in the Philippines is that Satan does not want us to even realize there's a battle or war going on. 
So he comes and speaks softly and seduces us into forgetting there's a battle. He makes us question God, makes us question ourselves and our commitments. And the question and make us start wondering, do we really want to be called out of his wonderful kingdom, which is not? Because that's what you and I have been called out to do, to come out of his kingdom, out of it. And we're the first, into, after Christ, into the kingdom of God. We're the first ones who will be reigning as kings and priests in the millennial reign of Yeshua when he returns. Now let's see what happened when, in Genesis 3, it says that Satan, the serpent, was more subtle, was more cunning, sneaky, wise than any other creature, and he still is. But he didn't come in with rockets and bombs against Adam and Eve. No, no, he came in seducing Eve, seducing or making her mind wonder and question God. And he lied about God because he's the father of all liars. He's a liar and he's a father of them. So in this war we're in, remember you're going to be lied to. Satan's temptations and thoughts will be lying to you. A little bit of truth and a little bit of lie, and a lot of lie. Things like, it's not that big of a sin. Come on, enjoy yourself. You can always repent later. It's just a little white lie. It's not a big lie. But if you tell the absolute truth, it can hurt people. So tell the little white lie. Or the sun set, and the Sabbath's here now. It's already begun. I've had to fight this too. Uh, we probably all do from time to time. And uh, are we home and ready to meet the Sabbath and to meet God with the Sabbath and everything ready? Or are we still really trying to end up work after the sun has gone down Friday night, the beginning of Shabbat? Surely God will understand just a couple more errands and a couple little more jobs we've got to get done. I know it's after sundown, but is it really that big of a deal? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Surely watching shows that show extreme violence or sexual depravity, sexual sin, nudity. Come on, it's not all that bad. Who am I hurting? I'm just watching a little, it feels good and enjoy that. You want, we say to ourselves carnally, guys, that's when the battle should be going on. No, no, that's not of God's kingdom. I'm not going to enjoy watching sinners sin. So his attacks and works on our minds, it works on our minds and on our thoughts. And uh, that's what he did to Adam and Eve. And Adam and Eve, Adam just stood there next to her. Genesis, 6, Genesis 3 verse 6 says that. Adam was right there with her. In Genesis 3 verse 4, 4 to 6, the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. When he said, has God really told you you can't eat of all the trees? And she said, we can eat of all the trees, but not this one, nor should we touch it. Oh, unless we die. For in the day we touch it, we shall die. And they did die in the day they touched with it. A day says a thousand years. They didn't quite make the thousand years, did they? But in Genesis 3, verse 4, then the serpent said to the woman, you won't die. That was a lie. God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open. You're not going to die. Your eyes will be opened. And you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. You'll be wise. You'll understand. He just doesn't want you to be like him knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, she probably was hungry that day too. So she had some lust in her that, oh, I could really use some food right now. And it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise. She took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her and, and he, he ate. Eve made the mistake of flirting with sin hanging around sin. I make that mistake too often. You do too. We all do. Instead of realizing I shouldn't be here, I shouldn't be around these people, I shouldn't be doing this, I shouldn't be watching this, I shouldn't be uh, giving in to my temper about that's beginning to boil inside of me, I shouldn't be giving in to my laziness, I should get out and get something done. I need to put God first, okay, we, con we converse with sin. It's not that big of a deal. Over and over, though, Scripture tells us to flee temptation, flee sin, flee idolatry, flee immorality. The word flee is in there all through the Bible. Yeshua had to face Satan. We, 
should get our, get away from Satan, but Yeshua had to be taken there to face him, to beat him, to win and have the victory, which he had to do and he did do. You read that at the end of chapter 3 of Matthew and the beginning of chapter 4. It's not wise for us to try to outsmart Satan or, or his people. Uh, just get out of there. We need to be smarter than that and defeat the battle before it gets too intense. The thoughts, the thoughts that are going in our head. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 to 5. I'm going to be reading out of the, out of the complete Jewish Bible. For although we live in the world, we don't wage war in a worldly way, according to the flesh, okay? Because the weapons we use to wage war are not worldly. On the contrary, our weapons have God's power. I want you to notice some key words here. God's power for demolishing, not just being one who's participating in a fight, demolishing strongholds. When I was preparing the sermon, I, I, I had to admit to God in prayer that I've been a little lackadaisical, a lot lackadaisical in the last few months. And uh, so I started the series on becoming holy or being holy and the wedding of the Lamb to get myself excited again of what lies ahead. And this sermon here, we should be using power of God to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every arrogance that raises itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take every thought captive and make it obey the Messiah. We bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Jesus Christ, as the New King James or the King James says. We don't flirt with the enemy. We take it captive. The thoughts that are not right, we must never do that. And we replace them with the thoughts that are mentioned in Philippians 4, 8. Whatsoever things are just and noble and good and right and true, good report, all of the things listed there in Philippians 4, 8. Go back and read that. Make a note of it. Go back and read that after the sermon. That's what we should be replacing our bad thoughts with, good thoughts. Now, the Apostle John describes the process of how sin gets started. And notice the similarity to what happened with Adam and Eve. Adam was not deceived, by the way. Eve was. 1 John 2, verses 15 and 16, Do not love the world or the things in the world. 1 John 2, 15, 16. And uh, on the video version, of course, you have the uh, advantage of watching the, seeing the scripture right on the screen. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. 1 John 2, 16 now. Everything in the world, all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but of the world. Now notice how that corresponds to what Eve did. We'll try to put both 1 John 2, 16 up along with Genesis 3 and verse, I think it's verse 6. Uh, anyway, Eve was probably hungry, and notice it was the lust of the flesh. The tree was good for food. And then it says, lust of the eyes in 1 John 2, 16, and that it was pleasant to the eyes. Yeah, that uh, new expensive jewelry I can't really afford would look really nice on me, and it would make me look, the ladies might think, or some men, and it would make me really be impressive to everybody. Or if I pay for that $200 beauty shop, get all the things done, Pleasant to the eyes. And God says in 1 Peter 3, Women, let your beauty be of a beautiful heart. Have a beautiful insides. Have a beautiful heart. You know, no matter how old or wrinkled you become, if you're a kind person and a wonderful, that's a wonderful beauty to God. And then the next thing was pride of life. 1 John 2, 16, pride of life. What did Eve do? She wanted something that was desirable to make one wise. This was a major battle. She should have, what she should have done is called to Adam to help her and to call to Jehovah. Ye Jehovah, there's someone, something in this garden right now I've never seen before. And he's telling us to disobey you. Help. And they would have received the help and they would have overcome Satan. She didn't resist the wrong thoughts. Adam didn't help her fight. She was deceived. Adam wasn't. So the first sinner really was Adam. And so watch how she sinned. Instead of calling out to her husband, she flirted with the sin. And we do that too. We stay around. We shouldn't be staying around. Go now to James chapter 1, verses 12 to 15. And so when we have these thoughts of being, a, that we feel abandoned by God, 
we, we, we let the thoughts come in of, of uh, uh, just imagining, you know, whatever, whatever it is we do, the, the wrong imaginations, uh, the sins of lack of self-control, of alcohol abuse, of eating too much. That's when I got to fight too. Or enjoying and imagining things with that woman's breast over there a bit too much. She's showing a lot of it and we're enjoying it instead of resisting that and turning our eyes away so we're not tempted. And that's what Yeshua said, that if you lust after, it's the, in his eyes the same as adultery. Letting ourselves feel abandoned by God, given up by God, letting sinful thoughts and we don't resist them and overcome them. Or letting that anger stew inside of us, a lack of forgiveness and not willing to be reconciled to anybody. God says, if you don't forgive others, you won't be forgiven. So we've got to fight. That should be a real fight. That should be a real fight. James 1, 12 to 15. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. And Yeshua said that if you love me, keep my commandments. We read that last week uh, in, in, in John 14. And, and here in James 1 verse 13, Let no one say when he is tempted, I'm tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he's lured away and enticed by his own desires. Then when his desires have conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's full grown, brings forth death. So we're tempted when we're lured away instead of going the other way. We should flee temptation. And don't leave a forwarding address. Just get out of there. I preach to myself. I preach to myself. I'm battling the same battles. So we have to be aware of the fight, engage in it with all of our might, not flirting. Not a few men of God have had problems with uh, anger, with uh, adultery, with internet porn. And it's easy to hide this terrible sin, excuse ourselves that we're not really hurting anybody. And we're fools if we think that. Fools. It hurts us. It does hurt us. It hurts our relationship in marriage. It hurts our future marriage if you're single. And it's all out lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes. And we've got to fight it and not go there. There's a story my brother told me of, uh, he'd heard the story of 10 Christian men on the, way, on, on the way to a spiritual retreat. And on the way, they had to stop at a hotel on the way up to where they were going, in a motel. And while they're checking in, they're trying to convince the owner of the motel that he should accept Christ as his savior. And he said he'd sleep on it. Next morning when they're checking out, they asked him, well, what have you decided? And he said that he realized that most of them were married men, but he said to them all, every single one of you watched a porn movie in your motel room last night. So no, I'm not going to feel like you guys are sincere. I can't go what you, with what you're trying to tell me. And so that's what I mean. We have to resist it. When, sometimes we think we're all by ourselves. No one's really around. No one really sees. No one's going to know. And that's when we really can see. That's when God can really see what we're really like. And I preach to myself, all of us, when we're by ourselves, how are we when someone's being taking their, a long time with, and you're running out of patience? Or someone cuts in front of you and you almost have an accident? Or... You know, someone on the phone is not giving you the service you think you deserve. I've made those mistakes in the past, and I don't want them to keep making them. I want to overcome that. I want to have the self-control and the patience that comes with the fruit of God's Spirit. And so it's easy to say, well, no one's going to see this. I'm okay. No one, no one knows except God, except Yeshua, except the four living creatures around their throne and the seraphim above it, the six-winged angels, and the 24 elders around the throne, and hundreds of millions of angels, and Satan, and his demons, and now we've given him something to attack us with before God, to accuse us of. Yeah, it, we're never alone. The cameras are always on. 
the cameras are always on. So we're in a fight. And the really, really big battles are coming soon. We must win the little battles by comparison now. So when the big ones come and maybe our very lives are at stake or torture is at stake or beheadings at stake, there's no hesitation. I read these stories from a group called Voice of the Martyrs and they tell me about the people from Cambodia or Laos or, or Pakistan or someplace and they become a Christian and how dangerous their life becomes. Each time I read those stories, I have to say, would I be so brave as this woman or that man? I talked about one of them last time. So how are we going to win these battles? Let's, let's get into that. The biggest point that I can think of, my point number one, is we must be in Christ. In 2008, I gave a sermon titled, The Blessing of Being in Christ in God. Blessing of Being in Christ in God. We must stay so close to him that it looks like we're part of him. We are part of him. We're so close to him that we, Yeshua himself, Yeshua is Jesus, of course, it means Savior. Yeshua himself said, abide in me like a branch to a vine, like a branch on a tree. You can't get any closer. That branch is part of that tree. It's part of that vine. I'll get into that a little more in a few minutes here. Christ, Messiah, he is now our life. He is now our victory. Yeshua has overcome Satan. He's overcome the world, he says in John 16, 33. Be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. Well, good for you. Well, it's good for us too because we are now part of his body. We are in him. You have to understand in him. Paul said we were crucified with him and raised up with him. Ephesians 1 and Ephesians 2. Raised up with him, seated at his right hand. And so if we're in him, wherever Yeshua is, we are also. Paul says, I, we're raised up out of baptism, you know, with him. We're in him. And because we're in him, we can also have this victory over Satan. Now, if we're truly in Christ, his love and power should be all over us. Satan can't do anything beyond what God allows. Our confidence of defeating Satan and his wile should be 100%. If we know we're in Messiah. If we know we're abiding in him. I found, by the way, I don't want to forget to say this, that the days where I'm really, really seeking God with all my heart and being and spending time with him, I don't have the temptations that I have on days when I'm skipping some of that. I really don't, and you won't either. Your mind is so full of Christ, there's nothing left. It's like I gave in the sermon about being holy, that when God's presence filled, the temple of Solomon filled the tabernacle of Moses when, when he came down to glorify it. There was no room, not even for priests to be in there. Nothing else was there except the glory of God. This one point, if I stopped right there, this is the real key to being a victor. In, Jer in Joshua chapter 5, Joshua chapter 5, verses 13 to 15, Joshua and the Israelites were getting ready to attack Jericho. And uh, we'll, we'll put it up there. John 5, uh, if I say John, I mean Joshua here. Okay, Joshua 5, verses 13 to 15. It came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man was there opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. Joshua, of course, is a man of war himself. He was the commander of the Israelite armies under Moses. Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or against us? <laughs> Are you for us or for our enemies? And the man standing with his drawn sword said, Nope, but as commander of the army of Jehovah, I have now come. It's not you anymore, Joshua, it's me. I'm commander of this army and of the army of Jehovah. Joshua recognized now that this was the one we now know as Yeshua, the word of God. And he fell on his face to the earth and worshipped. He can only worship God. So this had to be a God being. God the Father, you have God the Word. And Joshua said to him, What does my Lord, Adonai, what does my Lord say to his servant? And the commander of the Jehovah's army says to Joshua, Take your sandals off your foot. 
feet, for the place where you stand is holy. And Joshua did so. It was holy because the one standing there was holy, and even dirt becomes holy. Okay? For the place you stand, what he said to Moses was, uh, for even the, where you, the, the dirt you stand on is holy. The next couple of verses, remember there were no chapter breaks in the original, says very clearly, then Jehovah said, says very clearly that this is the same one who is also called Jehovah. If that's confusing you, go back to my sermon about who is Jehovah and how Jehovah can mean God the Father and also is applied many times in the Bible to the one we know as God the Word. Context tells us which one it was. In this particular case, since he saw him, this is God the Word. Now sometimes, here's another point. Sometimes we realize we can't completely defeat Satan. It seems like we're having a hard time with certain sins, certain habits, and it's just rough. We just simply can't uh, seem to get the victory. In times like that, I found strength in praising Yeshua, I'm praising God the Father, and admitting my failings in some areas of my life, and I do have them. And in my prayer, I say, Lord, I can't seem to get on top of this. It keeps coming back. I want to beat it, whether it's eating too much or temper or anything. And you in me can, Yeshua, you in me can defeat this. I and you can do it. So I cast this burden, I cast this obstacle to you for you to take care of. I know you can overcome all things and have overcome all things. And some encouragement, it says in 1 Corinthians 10, let's put it up there, verses 12 to 13, that God will never tempt us beyond that which we're able, but will with the temptation give us a way of escape so we may be able to bear it. So if something seems too much, Take it to God, you take it to Yeshua, and you say, I, I need help with this. Will you take it from me? Will you carry it with me, for me? King Yeshua is our Savior. We know that. And there was a time that you accepted him out loud in front of the witnesses at your baptism. And you all should repent and be baptized if you have it, immersed completely in water by, by a minister of God. But... He not only saved us at baptism and our repentance, I think he continues to save us minute by minute in, in one way, in the way that we have these battles and these temptations. I can call out to him, saved by the blood of the Lamb. You know, I have blood that's keeping me alive. If I cut myself and germs get in there, guess what my blood does today, right now? It sends the, the white blood vessels the warrior vessels to go fight that infection that's about to start and it makes a pussy infection. The pus is the dead warriors of the white blood cells that fights it, that keeps it outside, that keeps you from dying. And so in the same way, I say to Yeshua, I said, please be like that for me and help me make these victories in you because I'm in you. And we too can overcome Satan. We will do it by the blood of the Lamb. The blood of Jesus paid the ransom price. It cleansed us. But it continues to cleanse us. Actually, I think in 1 John 1, uh, it's an ongoing context. It just comes to my mind now. 1 John 1, around verse 7, 8, 9, that uh, his blood continues, if you look at the Greek there, to continue to cleanse and wash us. Now, Yeshua said we have to be so in him that it's like a, I mentioned a couple minutes ago, it's like a branch attached to a tree. The branch is part of the tree. The tree is part of the branch. So John 15, 5, he says, I'm the vine. You are the branches. They may have been walking through a part of a vineyard at this point on their way to Gethsemane. And he might have said, look, look at these here. See that vine? I, that's me. I'm the vine. The branches here, that's you guys. He who abides in me and I in him. You want to know how to grow, how to overcome, how to be a victor? It's right there. He who overcomes bears much fruit. He who abides in me bears much fruit. Without me, you can do nothing. What does abide in me mean to you? 
In Yeshua's mind, abiding means so close that you're part of it. The branch is part of the tree. It's on the tree. You can't get any closer. You're part of the vine, part of him. Are you there yet? We should be striving to be that close. And that's frankly our main work. Our main work is to fight hard and strive hard to be attached to him, to stay that close to him. It takes effort because Satan's constantly pulling us away with things we have to do, things that are urgent, things that are important. And he, he makes us think like prayer and abiding in Christ is not as important as taking this phone call or watching this, checking out my Facebook or whatever it is. And I have to fight those too. It means hanging with Christ every, all day long, all throughout the day. In prayer, in thought, being with him is what I mean. In love, in loyalty, in obedience, in submission. He's there all day long for us if we'll be there all day long for him. And he says, without me, you can do nothing. We just read it. John 15, 5. Without me, you can do nothing. What does nothing mean to you? It doesn't mean we can't drive to work or make our bed or, or cook a, a dinner or whatever. No, he's talking about spiritually. The things that last forever. You can do nothing without me. Paul gives the contrast and says, but with him, in him, we can do all things. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, Philippians 4.13. Everything now is possible. And without him, nothing is possible. I'll choose the everything. And I'll, I'm going to try with this sermon here to seek him with all my being more than I ever have before, and I hope it's impacting you the same way. John 15, 6, If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch, and is withered, and they gather them up, throw them in the fire, and they're burned. Abiding in Christ results in Christ living in us the way he used to live, obediently, perfectly. If we perfectly abided in him, then we will more and more live like that, because we'll be releasing his power, releasing his life, releasing his presence in us, and everything we say and do and the way we act. First we abide, and then we do. Now we can obey once we first abide, because it's Yeshua's life, it's Jesus' life, living obediently now, not our own life. Philippians 1, I think it's 11, might be 10, 11, or 12, but I think it's 11, Philippians 1, 11, where it says, I believe, I remember right, I have to put this in the notes, uh, that we bear the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ. Okay, the fruits of righteousness are by Jesus Christ. It's by the Holy Spirit, which is the indwelling presence of God the Father and Jesus Christ right in us. So seek him, abide in him, live obediently. Recently I had a decision I had to make, and I was toying with different things, and I emailed a good friend of mine I respect, a good, a good man of God. And I finally, after saying the problem, I said, what would you do? What do you advise? And he said to me three words with a period after each one. Very short, but very deep. He said, pray, period. Listen, period. Do, period. Pray, listen, do. I looked at that and I loved that. Ponder that. Pray, listen, do. The listen and doing part, I think probably the hardest, sometimes the hardest for some of you, will be to pray. We like to stew on our problems. We like to, I've done that, where you can go days and this thing just fills your mind and you're worried and you're upset. And what am I going to do? How am I going to get out of this pickle I'm into? Um, what am I going to do? I've lost my job. I have no money. Uh, what am I going to do? My wife is divorcing me. I'm, my wife isn't divorced. I'm saying situations we find ourselves in. And we stew on these things instead of giving them to Christ and letting his mind be in us. So listen. And then be sure to start by abiding in prayer. And then you make, make sure you listen. When I try to pray, I try to have a notepad handy. And then do. Do what God's telling you to do. You know for sure it's of God. So number one, abide in him. Number two, directly connected to abiding in him. It's really part of it. Pray often. Pray in the spirit often. 
Stay in constant contact with your supreme commander. Constant contact in any war. One of the first targets, if not the first target, is the enemy's communications abilities. Let's bomb out their communications systems. They'll bomb out ammunition dumps and tanks and airplanes and bombers and airports and oil refineries. Sure, they'll do all that too. But they're for sure going after the communications ability. It's confuse them. They can't communicate. Maybe we can have a clip showing that. I don't know if we can or not. Uh, but what is our communications called? It's called prayer. It's often prayer. It's constant prayer. It's regular prayer. It's clear and fervent prayer. It's prayer of praise. It's prayer of adoration. It's prayer of sadness sometimes. It's prayer conveying your love for God and your gratitude for all that he does for us. But he, our God, is the one who defeats our enemies, but he does like us involved, and he likes us praying about it. I found this the other night when I was almost accidentally just reading through the Psalms. Psalm 44, verses 2 to 6. I think it's David here. He says, You drove out the nations with your hands, but them, the nation of Israel, you planted. You afflicted the peoples and cast them out. For they did not gain possession of the land by their own sword. Okay, you got it? You're not going to have the victory by what you and I do on our own efforts. Psalm 44, verse 3. They didn't gain possession of the land by their own sword, nor did their own arm save them. It was your right hand, your arm. Who's at the right hand of Almighty God? It's Yeshua, the commander of the Lord of hosts. The word of God it was your right hand and the light of your countenance because you favored them. You are my king, O God. Command victories for Jacob. Through you we will push down our enemies. And then the verse 6, I will not trust in my bow nor shall my sword save me. No, no, I'm going to trust in you. Through you we'll have victory. I love that passage. That hasn't changed. Our victory over the enemy, Satan means enemy, means adversary. That's why in Hebrew they call him Hasatan. Ha means the, Satan. So thus Satan means the enemy. They, that's what they call him, the enemy, the adversary. Our victory is by the same approach. Looking to God for victory while he gets us to be part of the battle. I mean, God could have given uh, uh, Goliath a heart attack. He didn't need to have David get out there with his sword. But God likes to get us involved and have us grow in faith and trust in him. So are we engaged in the battle? Absolutely God wants us engaged in the battle. Through you we will push down our enemies. Verse 5, I just read that, right? God gives us the strength. Be strong in the power of his strength. Ephesians 6, around verse 10 or so. We have to be engaged in the battle. Know we're in a battle. Realize we're in a battle. Psalm 1839. Psalm 1839. You have armed me with strength for the battle. You have armed me with strength for the battle. You have subdued under me those who rose up against me. Paul calls it again, the fighting in the power of his might. But we do have to put on the armor, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation. We do have to, and then after putting on all that armor, Paul ends it by saying, praying always. Let's read that. Praying is what activates that armor, and, and uh, prayer is our communications. Prayer is that victory. Prayer is the abiding in Christ that lets us do all things. Okay, Ephesians 6, verses 16 to 18. Above all, taking the shield of faith... Above all, taking the shield of faith. I just got scared there for a second. I have a blank page here right after this page. <laughs> I thought, what did I have next after this? But fortunately, the copier just printed out two pages. But I have shield of faith. <laughs> anyway, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked one. Well, oh, he's always shooting at us. Put that shield up. It's a full body shield. Take the helmet of salvation. 
Okay, that protects our mind. I've been called to be saved. I've been called for eternal life. I've been called to be forgiven and saved. And the sword of the Spirit, God's Spirit gives us a sword, which is the Word of God. We'll talk about that next, uh, in, in a few minutes. Praying always. I'm talking about prayer right now. Praying always with all prayer and, 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 and supplication in the Spirit. Okay, praying always, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication. Praying always, Ephesians 6, verse 18, with all prayer and supplication, that's when you're praying for other people, in the Spirit. Have you learned to pray in the Spirit? So abiding in Christ means we've got to be in frequent prayer daily throughout the day, praying in the Spirit. Not just once or twice or three times a day, but Paul says praying always throughout the day, having that contact. I'm really working on that, that throughout the day, just keep making contact with him. Praying in the flesh means that we have our set things we want to talk about, our prayer list. Nothing wrong with a prayer list, but if that's all we do, that's not praying in the spirit. Praying in the flesh is praying the things we want to get done, the things we want, the gimmies we want to bring up to God. Give me this, give me that. Um, and we push through. We, we, we push through the, the things we have on our mind. Uh, it's not wrong like that. But praying in the Spirit, and, and, and you can combine the two. And by the way, sometimes I'll just say even the quote-unquote Lord's Prayer, uh, repeat it because, and then elaborate on each phrase as I say it. Sometimes I'll read through a couple of Psalms and then use that also as a springboard. But praying in the Spirit means we're, we feel God's presence. We feel He's right there with us. We're in His very presence. He's right there. We speak, but we also listen. Praying in the Spirit is letting God's Spirit, which is God's presence Himself, propel our prayer back to Him in heaven on the sea of glass. Praying in the Spirit even controls how we pray. Sometimes it, it feels ecstatic, with joyful arms, like a little child running up to see his daddy coming home from Afghanistan or someplace. I watched that happen one time in, in an airport. A, a, a man in, in, in military uh, fatigues was coming around the corner, and a, a group of a family, his wife and kids, and this little, I think it was a little girl now, came running up arms up like this, as she ran up to him, Daddy, Daddy. In Hebrew, she'd be saying, Abba, Abba. Daddy, Daddy. Praying in the Spirit is just that ecstatic joy. Daddy. Sometimes when I'd come home from work when the kids were younger, they outgrew this later on, I think. They get cool and they get in their teenage years. But, but when they were like three, four, five, six years old, I really enjoyed sometimes coming home and then hearing the chant inside, Daddy's home, Daddy's home, Daddy's home. I love that. It's Daddy home. Is Daddy home for you? Galatians 4, verse 6, Because, because you are sons, because you're children, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, just like at Gethsemane, in his agony, Yeshua says, Abba, Father, is there some other way? The Spirit of his Son into our hearts, crying out, Daddy, Abba, Father. Great thing is we can say Daddy to the being who is number one in the entire universe. He controls it all. He's God Most High. Other times when we're praying in the Spirit, it's more like groaning, the Bible says. It's the Spirit of God at work. You may be uh, prostrate, prostrate, flat out on the floor. Have you ever prayed like that? Try it sometimes. In agony, just get right down. Face on the carpet. Whole body laid out flat. There are examples in Scripture of that. On your floor, crying out to him. This was Hannah's prayer. She was standing in this case, but it was this kind of prayer for a son. In 1 Samuel 1, her lips were moving, but she was crying, and she was speaking from the agony 
of her heart. Eli thought she was drunk. She said, no, my Lord, it's not, I'm not drunk. It's from the agony of my heart. I'm just asking God for a, a man-child, a boy. So Romans 8, verses 26 to 27. Go back and read that story on your own, by the way, 1 Samuel 9, I'm sorry, 1 Samuel 1, 1 Samuel 1, verses 9 to 18. Similarly, the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. Romans 8, verse 26 and 27. I'll read it out of the complete Jewish Bible. The Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we don't know how to pray the way we should. But the Spirit himself, and I think himself's fine, because I really believe the Spirit is God's indwelling presence. God himself, that's him, dwelling inside of us. The Spirit himself pleads on our behalf with groanings too deep for words. And the one who searches hearts knows exactly what the Spirit's thinking because his pleadings for God's people are in accord with God's will. So praying in the Spirit is not a set, defined prayer. It's submitting to whatever God's Spirit wants from you and me, wants us to see, wants us to say. God's Spirit even interprets what we can't seem to get out, what we're really trying to say from a broken heart, perhaps. I'll give a sermon on prayer. It's coming up soon, I hope. But for now, my point is this. We won't abide in Christ without constant prayer. Don't fear it. If you fear God's presence, overcome that because it's the most beautiful thing when you can feel it and receive it. Don't walk away from it. Don't turn from it. Welcome it. If you feel like crying, like Hannah, like I often have. I remember hearing my mother pray sometimes. She didn't know I was in the next room or had come home or whatever. And sometimes I, I could hear her. I could hear her singing. I could hear her singing in prayer. Other times, I would hear her crying in prayer. Other times, it was hallelujahs in prayer. Because my mom knew how to pray in the Spirit. I'm sorry about that, but my mom died when I was 40 years old. I'm 67 now. It's been a long time, Mom. But I'll see her again. Communicate. Communicate often, at least three times a day, but don't make it a chore, to-do list. I, I used to do that as a to-do list, and it can't be that. It's got to be constant contact. It's got to be presence, involvement, the Holy Spirit. If we still miss days, I'm going to be a little blunt here. If I still miss days, starting the day in prayer, ending the day in prayer, and throughout the day in prayer, then I'm an idiot. And you're an idiot. Because without me, you can do nothing. And the abiding in Christ is by prayer, by the constant contact. I want to be really clear on that. That's why I said it that way. When we skip prayer, we're saying we don't need you, Father. We don't need you, Yeshua. We've gone solo. We've gone rogue. We're not communicating. And that's really foolish. It's idiotic. I'm not going to soften that. That's what it is. I've made that mistake too many times not to know that it's idiotic. Stop it. Luke 9, turn over there, Luke 9, verses 28 to 29. It's while we're in prayer that Satan is most afraid. He hates to see God's children on their knees. That's the best battle position. That's the best battle position, on our knees. It was, as, it was when and as Christ prayed that his visage was transformed. Did you realize that? Have you seen that before? Matthew 17, I don't know if it mentions it there, but in the Luke account here, Luke 9, verse 28 to 29, 29, it came to pass about eight days after these things, he took Peter, John, and James and went up to the mountain to pray. He loved to pray. He loved to pray many times in the wilderness, in the mountain, away from people. Notice verse 29. I didn't notice this before. Luke 9, verse 29. And as he prayed, during his prayer, as he prayed, the appearance of his face was altered. And his robe became white and glistening. 
Prayer unleashes the glory of God inside of us. I've got to get better at praying more. <laughs> I want that. In, in Gethsemane, it was Yeshua's most pressing time of trial. And before it all really began, you know, the scourging and all that, what did he do? Did he stew and worry and talk with his disciples? Oh, what am I going to do? I wonder if I'm going to make it. No. He prayed three times. Each time was about an hour, apparently. Because he says, anyway, let's see what he said here. Matthew 26, verse 40 and 41. He prayed, he prayed and prayed and prayed. At one time, he said he was so distressed. He said to his disciples, Matthew 26, 38. He says, I'm so distressed. All the, I, I could die. I could just die. But in prayer, he came up over that. In prayer, he came back to a man of peace. In prayer, he is able to meet the people coming up to arrest him with clubs and swords and say, who is it whom you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. He says, I am. Okay, that's what he said. I am. And he was very bold at that point. He wasn't stewing and, and, and at, at the point where he could just die, uh, you know, hours before. But the prayer, look how that strengthened our, the very Son of God. If he needs to pray, you and I need to pray. So we beat and win these battles. He couldn't, have, he couldn't lose the battle now in the last 24 hours of his life as a human. Then he came to the disciples, found them sleeping. Matthew 26, 40, 41. And he said to them, Peter, could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter temptation. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. I know you mean well, but you've got to pray to put more energy in that flesh of yours. When we don't pray, we're telling God we don't see how serious it is. In James 4, verses 7 and 8, we should be talking to Jesus all the time and saying, Save us today, Lord. Therefore, submit to God. James 4, verse 7 and 8. Submit to God. Resist the devil. There's the fight. And he will flee from you, especially if you do it like verse 8 says, draw near to God. When he sees us on our knees, when Satan sees us on our knees and drawing near to God, he flees. Because he knows he won't be able to beat us and we will resist him successfully. Draw near to God. He will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. How do we cleanse it? We cleanse our hands in the washing of the water by the word and by the blood of Jesus Christ. And purify your hearts, you double-minded. Draw near to God and, and resist the devil and he will flee. So, Satan's terrified of us when we're battling on our knees. Prayer is so important that not even the Son of God went past much time without praying. In fact, the Son of God said in uh, John 5, 19, Even I, the Son of God, even I, Jesus Christ, can do nothing outside of my Father. Without my Father, I can do nothing. If he could say that and admit that, how much more should we understand that that is true for us? Jude 20, verse 21. Uh, let's, uh, Luke 20, 21. Uh, just one chapter. Let's read that too. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. Praying in the Holy Spirit. Let God's Spirit guide your prayer. Let God's Spirit lead where it's going. Let God's Spirit tell you what to pray about. Let God's Spirit, as you listen to Him, sometimes it'll be groaning, sometimes it'll be praise, sometimes it'll be adoration, sometimes it'll be help me. <laughs> Praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Third point, first one is be in Him, second one is pray constantly in the Spirit to Him. Uh, therefore helping you abide. The third one is fight temptation with the word of God, the sword that God's given you. The word is the sword. Um, we've got to be in God's word far, far more. So when situations arise, scriptures are popping into our mind. We don't need to know where it is. We don't need to know if it's Zephaniah 4 verse 1 or if it's, or if it's Matthew 4 verse 1 or whatever. No, we just have to know it's somewhere in there. That's all. Even Paul a couple of times says, somewhere in the scriptures it says blah, blah, blah. Every single time in Matthew 4, when, when Yeshua had to face Satan and all these temptations, his response every single time was, it is written. Don't you try to give me your thinking. 
I'm going to tell you what God's word says. It is written. Bread's not enough. We shall live by every word of God. It is written, you shall worship God and him alone shall you serve. It is written, you shall not test or tempt the Lord your God. It is written, Satan will constantly make you doubt God, even with, even with Jesus, with Yeshua, if you be the Son of God. He was constantly making us feel, making him feel like, you can't surely be a Christian. You can't surely be a child of God. Look at you, you miserable sinner. In Jesus' case name, he wasn't a sinner, but he constantly put that thought there. If you be the Son of God, come down off that cross. If you be the Son of God, change the, the stones into bread. Ah, see, you won't, because you're not really Son of God. He'll attack you the same way. You know you've got to have God's mind, that he will never leave you nor forsake you, that he's always there with you. I have all these verses filling your mind, that you're beloved of God, well-pleasing to God. Study daily. Start in prayer, even asking God to show you verses he wants you to see. Besides the Bible study that you do fervently, that's my main study. As an aside to that, I have audio Bibles, different translations on audio, that as I make my bed, as I tidy up, as I brush my teeth, as I shave, I have an audio Bible going as much as I can. And when I even lay down in bed, I'll have it running. And I'll try to listen to each chapter at least twice, sometimes three times. So I really know that particular chapter and that, really, and that particular book pretty well by the time I'm done. I'm not studying it. I'm just listening to it at the, that point. But it really, really helps. Instead of listening to music that might have wrong thoughts or words or depressing words, who knows? Instead of watching whatever, the, the news nonstop, put on God's word. So fighting sin is about fighting anything, any thought, any will that poses itself against God. And we have to have a sharp sword to defeat it. That word of God is our sword. We've got to be studying like crazy, okay? And uh, take up your sword of the Spirit. Take it up. Don't leave it behind you. If you start the day without Bible study, you end the day without Bible study, you've just gone into battle without a sword, without your modern-day warfare, without your assault rifle and your bullets. That's what we're doing. Fill your heart and mind. Soak them in God's word. Let this mind be in you which was in Jesus. And his mind is the word of God. Okay, number four. Now we have to do what we, what we learn in the Bible, what we're, God's spirit's giving us. We have to understand our orders and then obey them. It's also called God's commandments, right? Do you remember pray, listen, do? Well, this is the do part. At baptism, I was asked, Philip, have you repented of your sins, which is the breaking of God's Ten Commandments, and have you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and King and Savior? And I said, yes, I have. I don't know if I really understood that back then as deeply as I do now, that it was an abject, total, unconditional surrender that I was supposed to be doing, that he should be Lord of every aspect of my life. I'm still working on that. Now, that's the do part. <laughs> Know and write down your weak points. In any battle, you have to know where you're weak and you have to know where you might be strong, but let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. So do the Bible studies on your weak points. See what God's Word says. It says an awful lot about an awful lot of things. The Bible says in James 1, 22 to 25, that when we do the Bible study, it's like looking into a mirror. Look at this, James 1, 22. Be doers of the Word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Verse 23. James 1, verse 23. For if anyone is a hearer of the word, not a doer. Yeah, you like to hear the Bible. You like to read the Bible. You like to hear the sermons. He's like a man observing his natural face in a mirror, but he, he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. He forgets the dirt that he saw on his face. He forgets the spot he missed when he shaved, whatever. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer, a doer of the work. This one will be blessed in all that he does. So the word of God exposes what we are. We should be thankful for that, where we need more work. Too many of us do some Bible study or listen to scriptures and sermons, but we don't change. 
and tomorrow, next year, and the next year, we still have the same issues. We're not changing. To him who overcomes will I give power over the nations. To him who overcomes will I let him sit on my throne with me as I've overcome, as I've overcome and sit with my father on his throne. To him who overcomes, I'll give the white stone. To him who overcomes, all of these things are all mentioned in Revelation 2 and 3. Remember, Jesus said, Yeshua said, If you love me, keep my commandments. John 14, 12. And then John 15, 10 says that we will abide in his love if we keep his commandments. We have to do God's word. We could go on and on. There's all kinds of points about warfare and all that. Uh, Time-wise, I have to end it there. We're going to win by and in and through Jesus Christ, through Yeshua. Abiding in him, listening to what he says, doing what he says, seeking him in constant praying of the Spirit. God does still talk to us through strong thoughts and through his word. Know your armor. The SEAL Team 6 people, they have to be able to take apart their weaponry in the dark put it back together in the dark. We have to know our stuff. Please realize we're in the fight of your life. This is getting you ready for some big battles ahead. We've got to win them. We can win them. Whatever your battles are, whatever your weaknesses are, poor marriage, poor relationships with your children, fight like your life depends on it. You fight in prayer on your knees primarily and then do what the prayer tells you, what God's word tells you, what he tells you. And I think this constant contact with God in prayer and Bible study and being at one and in Christ will increase dramatically the odds of Luke 21, 36 happening to you. Pray that you be counted worthy to escape all these things that are coming to pass. I'd like it to be that at the end of our life, we can be like Paul writing to Timothy. 2 Timothy 4, verse 7 and 8. I'm sure Timothy felt this, when deeply felt this when he was reading it. 2 Timothy 4, verse 7 and 8. I have fought the good fight. Can you say you're fighting the good fight of faith? Against sin, against temptation, for God, for God's kingdom? Can you say that? I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day, and not to me only, but to all who loved his appearing. And then you can look forward to coming before Yeshua and hearing those words that I hope I hear, I hope you hear. Come. Come, you blessed of my Father. Come and inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Dear Father in heaven, thank you and praise you, dear God, for all whom you are, what you are, giving us your Son and his blood to cover us. We have so much to have covered. <laughs> thank you, Father. Help us realize we're in a fight. We're getting lukewarm. We're falling asleep. We're getting lackadaisical. We're getting lukewarm and lazy. Help us wake up. Help us be zealous. Help us seek you constantly and pray in the Spirit and all of these things that we mentioned here today. You be our God. You be our warrior. You be our victory through Christ. And through him we can do all things. We thank you and we praise you. We sure love you. You know that? We love you. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Yeshua. Help us love you more. Help us obey more. And help us love you with all of our being. Let our lives reflect you and be you living in us. In Yeshua's mighty, powerful name. Amen. Visit the Light on the Rock website where you can view additional videos, over 270 sermons, and 300 blogs as a scriptural study resource for those who desire to know God the Father and His Son and His incredible plan for all mankind. We are not a church, but a nonprofit organization providing in-depth biblical studies 
free for all who would like to visit our site. The Light on the Rock Foundation also supports an orphanage in Kenya, providing financial resources to support their living costs and education. We never ask for money. However, any donations are appreciated and will be used to support the Kenyan Orphanage and our site. Thank you for visiting. And if you find these teachings beneficial to you and your family, please share with others.